Well, this morning I want to talk to you about how to think about origins. And to begin with, if we're going to think correctly about origins, there's massive confusion in our, in our world today. We need to understand that there are two broad categories of science, two kinds of science. We can call them observational science and historical science. So, experimental science. Most of biology, chemistry, physics, engineering research, medical research, they're examples of experimental science, observational science. They produce our technology and cures for disease. So we can call that experimental or observational science. But that kind of science won't answer the question, how did those creatures come into existence? Now the question is not, how do we get a dog from another dog? The question is, how did the first dog come into existence? How did the first elephant, the first cat, come into existence? How did the Grand Canyon form? How did the rock layers that are all over the earth how did they come into existence and when? How did those objects that we see in the heavens come into existence and when? Those are historical questions. And for that kind of question, we need historical science. And so historical geology, paleontology, archaeology, cosmology are forms of origin science. They're trying to reconstruct the unobserved past to explain what we see in the present. Most people today, including most evolutionists, including most evolutionary scientists, either are confused about these two kinds of science or deny that there's any difference between them. And so they see the results of experimental science and all the technology and the cell phones and the computers and say, science can do what it says it does. And so since those are sciences, they're telling us the truth also. Nope. Because in order to reconstruct the past, you have to make assumptions. Assumptions affect what you see, and they affect how you interpret what you see to reconstruct the past. And today, there are two ways of looking at the evidence to try to reconstruct the past. The dominant view that most scientists use is, man can decide the truth apart from God, uh, we don't believe the Bible is the word of God. We don't need to look at the Bible. It's irrelevant. We just look at the evidence and figure out the past. But Christians should be building their thinking on the word of God because it's the eyewitness testimony of the creator who was there. And so we picture those assumptions that are controlling science as a pair of glasses. Everybody is looking at the same world. They're looking at the same DNA, the same living creatures, the same fossils, the same rock layers, the same stars and galaxies, trying to reconstruct the unobserved past, but they have a different set of assumptions. Let's look in the head of the secular scientist. What are his starting assumptions? What are his starting points? Well, there are two main assumptions controlling science today. The first is that nature is all that exists. Not every scientist believes that. There are scientists who believe in God, but most scientists do their work as if that's true. Second assumption controlling science. Everything can and indeed must be explained by three things. Time and chance and the laws of nature working on matter. If you have those three things, time, enough of it, millions and billions of years, chance and the laws of nature, you can explain the origin of everything. You can explain the origin of stars and galaxies. You can explain the origin of the sun and the solar system, the origin of the earth and its rock layers and fossils. You can explain the origin of life, the origin of man, the origin of language, the origin of religion and culture. You just need enough time, chance, and the laws of nature. Well, those assumptions are what philosophers call the assumptions of naturalism but they're also known by another name. Those are the assumptions of the religion of atheism. And atheism is a religion. It's a religion that says God doesn't exist. It's a religion that says there are no moral absolutes. It's a religion that says there is no life after death. It's a religion that says you can just design your own life any way you want it, define anything any way you want it. It's a religion, and it is the religion that controls science today. One of the most famous evolutionists in America is Richard Lewontin at Harvard. He said this, Our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is the, is the key to an understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural. So what has he just done? 
He's defined science as naturalistic. You can't allow God in your thinking. He goes on. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdities of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated, unsubstantiated just-so stories like a fish walked out onto the land and became an amphibian, or a, a dinosaur evolved into birds, or a, an ape evolved into man. Because we have an a priori commitment, that is, a commitment to naturalism before we ever look at the evidence. A commitment to materialism, which is another name for atheism. Matter is all that exists. It is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material, i.e. natural, explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to correct an, create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is absolute. We cannot allow a divine foot in the door. We can't allow God in our thinking as scientists. That is an atheistic worldview. In fact, modern science was born in the Christian worldview. Christians were the ones who developed modern science because they were working, believing they were studying an orderly world made by an intelligent creator. But what that all means is we can't invoke an intelligent creator to explain the origin of living things. But I've never met Dr. Lewontin, but I am absolutely certain that he does not believe that those heads are the result of time and chance and the laws of nature. The wind and rain beating against a rock produce those. No, they're the result of creative intelligence. People who know how to use dynamite and jackhammers and chisels. How did those things come into existence? Well, you all know. It was the result of a tornado blowing through a junkyard. Just time and chance and the laws of nature. No, they're the result of creative intelligence. Well, how did those things come into existence? Well, the evolutionists say, no, those, aren't, those are the result of time and chance and the laws of nature. And you see, all of those animals, those, those are mammals, all of those animals descended from a common ancestor, the first mammal, which descended from some reptile. And this is a chart in an evolutionary uh, article on mammal evolution, and it says that all of the land mammals, swimming mammals, and flying mammals are descended from the first mammal. And they have charts like this in Encyclopedia Britannica showing that all the crocodiles and alligators and all the varieties of dinosaurs are all descended from a common ancestor called an archosaur. And the dinosaurs evolved into birds. That's how we got birds. And they have charts like this at the University of Michigan showing how a land animal evolved into whales. That's how we got whales. And they have charts like this showing that you evolved from an ape. And so they have the evolution tree of life. All the branches represent the different plants, animals, people. They're all descended from a common ancestor, the first microscopic single-celled creature which popped into existence in the primordial oceans three and a half billion years ago by time and chance and the laws of nature. And so I like to call this theory the microbe to microbiologist theory for the origin of living things. Or, more simply, from goo to you via the zoo. That's what evolutionists believe. They never say it that way, but that's what they believe. And then they interpret the geological record, the rock layers and fossils, as the record of the history of life. And they say from the first living microscopic single-celled creature up to the present is 1.9 to 3.8 billion years. And they say our solar system formed by time and chance and the laws of nature as a gas cloud collapsed, flattened out, and evolved into rings. So they're looking at the world through what we call evolutionized glasses. They believe that time and chance and the laws of nature can explain all this stuff. But Christians should be building their thinking 
on the word of God. They should put on biblical glasses. So let's look in the head of a Bible-believing Christian. He's looking at the same world. He has different starting points. He doesn't believe nature is all that exists. He believes that the eternal, good, all-knowing, all-powerful, holy God exists, and he created everything else. And he believes that God is not silent. He has spoken. And so the Bible is God's completely truthful eyewitness testimony which explains the key events in history so that we can correctly interpret the evidence from the origin and history of the creation. And when we look at the Bible, we see a history that's presented to us. And uh, we've summarized it as the seven C's of history. Seven words that start with C that remind us of the seven key events to understand our world. So creation explains why we live in a world where there are amazing plants and animals and people, the complex DNA molecule, the orderly movement of the heavenly bodies. And then we have corruption, the fall of Adam and Eve in sin when they rebelled against God, which is why all of us are sinners. And that brought death and disease and suffering into the world. It brought natural disasters, earthquakes, tsunamis, etc., and then we have uh, catastrophe, Noah's flood, which explains why we live on a planet that is covered with thousands of feet of sedimentary rocks containing billions of former living things that have been turned to stone, called fossils. And then we have confusion, the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11, which explains why we have different languages. And some of you, I can tell by looking at you, at least your ancestors didn't speak English. They spoke Chinese or Spanish or German. And the, when we add our modern understanding of genetics to that event, we can understand why there's all the physical differences that we see in terms of shades of brown, skin color, etc. And then Christ came into the world to solve the problem that started in the garden. He did that by his death and resurrection, and he's coming again to consummate history, to bring an end to all the death and disease and suffering, and to uh, uh, produce a new heavens and a new earth. So just briefly, a couple comments about creation. In Genesis 1, we have the creation account, and uh, God tells us that he made the land animals, the sea creatures and birds, uh, uh, the plants, and man, and there's a phrase that appears there ten times in Genesis 1. It's the phrase, after their kind, after its kind. A simple rule of Bible study or any other document you study. If you see the author repeating himself many times, you should say, aha, uh -huh, I think he's trying to emphasize something. After their kind, God created different plants and animals to reproduce after their kind. Now, here is the taxonomic classification system used in biology. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. What was the name of Charles Darwin's famous book? The Origin of Species. Darwin argued that species change. He argued against a view that some people had that the species had never changed from when God made them. That wasn't what Bible-believing Christians believed, but that's what some Christians believed who didn't pay attention to the Bible. But... We have good reasons to think now, as a result of studying living creatures, that the created kind in Genesis is not equivalent to the modern classification of species, but is equivalent to the family level in most cases. So God created Adam and Eve. He didn't create all those people. They are the descendants of Adam and Eve, and the diversity in the shades of brown skin color, whether they have green eyes, blue eyes, brown eyes, blonde hair, black hair, it's all the result of the genetics. He created the dog kind, and creationists and evolutionists are in agreement that probably the first dog was something like a gray wolf. And in the genetic code of those first dogs was all the genetic information to produce all of those variety of wild and domestic dogs. He created the elephant kind. 
And in the genetic information of those first elephants, I can't show you a picture of it because none of our elephants today look exactly like the first elephants. But in the genetic code was all the genetic information to make woolly mammoths, mastodons, African elephants, Asian elephants. The first bears had all the genetic information to produce all that variety of bears. Evolutionists classify those as different species, but they're the same kind and they can mate with each other and reproduce. God created the cats, the original cat kind, with all the genetic variation to produce all that variety. And the chicken kind and the horse kind with the great Clydesdale eventually, the zebra, the Shetland pony, uh, the zebra and what we have at the Creation Museum, the zonkey and the zorse. That's the horse kind. So, in contrast to the evolution tree of life, we have the creation forest of life. It's, each tree is a different kind of creature. The dog kind, the cat kind, the alligator kind, the chicken kind. They had in their genetic information uh, built-in variety, which was eventually expressed as they reproduced. But one kind didn't change into a different kind. And then two of every land animal kind and bird kind came on the ark. They came off the ark. They had more time to produce variety within their kind, but not to change into a different kind. Two histories of the origin and history of life. They are the only two views. Some people try to combine those views, but they're really only two views. Either everything is descended from a common ancestor, or it's not. And the evolutionists confuse people because they talk about evolution being simply change. But evolution is a certain kind of change. It's vertical change from one kind of creature into a completely different kind of creature. But creationists believe in change, but we believe in horizontal change. God supernaturally created different kinds of creatures. By his word, he called them into existence. And he built into their genetic code the ability to produce variety within their kind. Now, there's more kinds than six. I've just given these as examples. But here's the problem. Evolutionists are constantly giving examples of variation within a kind. And they say, see, that's evolution. No, that's not evolution. That's creation. This is evolution. And evolution is not only contrary to the Bible, it's contrary to the real scientific evidence. I don't have time to go into all of that, but let me proceed with the second C, corruption. The Bible says God made man in a perfect world, a very good world, where there was no death, disease, suffering. Man rebelled against God. They rejected the word of God. They believed the lie uh, of Satan speaking through a serpent, and that was the catas that that was the just the worst event that happened in the world because that brought death and disease and suffering and wars and crimes and corruption political corruption that causes uh, mass starvation like what's happening in Venezuela now with a, cor a corrupt dictator that has destroyed the the wealthiest country in Latin America to now be on the brink of total collapse but it also, the sin of, of Adam also brought the judgment of God on the whole creation. And so we have now earthquakes and tsunamis and volcanoes and earth and, and tornadoes. And Paul says in Romans that the whole creation is groaning and suffering. We don't live in that original very good creation. We live in a fallen creation, a broken world. Well, not only do evolutionists deny what Genesis 1 says about creation, they deny what Genesis 3 says about the fall of Adam. See, the Bible says death came after Adam. The evolutionists say no, death came before Adam. Millions and millions of years of death and bloodshed and violence and disease and asteroids slamming into the earth causing mass extinctions. Then there's catastrophe, Noah's flood which is the key to explaining the rock layers that we see beautifully in the Grand Canyon, but are all over the earth. They're under the forest here in Seattle. They're under my home in Kentucky. They're under the home I lived in in England or in uh, Hungary. And that global flood destroyed the surface of the earth. It lasted 371 days from start to end and it was designed to destroy the earth and destroy every land, animal, bird, and human not in the ark. 
And we see evidence of that catastrophic flood in the fossils. In uh, an ichthyosaur caught in the act of giving birth, buried alive. Or this fish that didn't get to finish swallowing lunch. Or these turtles caught in the act of mating. Or this beautifully preserved stag beetle. Or a fossilized worm, no hard parts. Had to be fossilized, buried rapidly, fossilized fast. And animal manure, fossilized. That had to happen very fast. And then we come to confusion, the Tower of Babel, which explains why we have all these different languages in the world. And why every country that I go to, I have to have somebody translate my slides and translate my speech. It also explains why there aren't races of people. There's one race, Adam's race. There's no such thing as a black race, or a white race, or a brown race, or a yellow race. There's only one race. Everybody is descended from Adam. We're all made in the image of God, and we all have a sin problem. And it doesn't matter what color your skin is, because actually we all have the same color of skin. It's just some of us have a little bit more color than others. So Genesis is the key to understanding the origin of people groups and languages. And then the last three C's, Christ, cross, and consummation. We start with a perfect world where there is no death, disease, sin. Man brings, rebels against God, brings all of that evil into the world. Jesus came into that world to solve the problem of sin. But he only started to solve it because he's coming again. And he's going to create a new heavens and a new earth where there won't be any more of all this evil that we see. So two different ways of looking at the world and interpreting the evidence. The eyewitness testimony of the Creator or the rejection of the eyewitness testimony of the Creator. But here's the problem in the church today. I've had the privilege of speaking in 27 countries and in every country I've been in, most Christians don't believe what God said. They put on evolutionized glasses to look at the world. And they're thinking about the world the same way the world thinks about the world. And so they try to fit evolution in millions of years into the Bible. And the only place they put it is before Adam. And so they either say that the days of Genesis 1 are not literal days of 24 hours, they're figurative of long periods of time, hundreds of millions of years each. Or some say, well, the days are literal, but we can put the millions of years between each of the days. And then some say, well, no, the days are literal and they're sequential and there's no time between them, but we'll put the millions of years before the first day in Genesis 1, between verses 1 and 2, and then others say, well, no, actually, Genesis isn't describing the creation of the world, uh, and so we'll put the millions of years and everything else before verse 1. But there are huge problems with all of those views. But all of those views have in common in either ignoring or rejecting the first four C's. And once you do that, you, re you destroy the foundation for the last three C's. And much of the church has rejected the gospel. They're called theologically liberal churches. And uh, the Western world of Western Europe, Great Britain, North America, has rejected the gospel. There are 130 million atheists in Europe. And there are probably 25% of American uh, population today that is atheist in profession or in practice. So as Christians we need to be wearing biblical classes whether we're thinking about the origin of animals or the origin of DNA or the origin of death or the origin of rock layers or the origin of sun, moon and stars or the origin of people groups or the origin of death or the origin of anything. We need to have biblical glasses. Well, why should we trust God more than the scientists or the majority of scientists? I believe we should trust God because, one, God was there at the beginning. God knows everything. He never went to school. He always tells the truth because he loves the truth. He never makes mistakes because he knows everything. And he loves us and he wants us to know the truth and the truth will set us free from the lies and the deceptions that surround us in the culture. But contrast that with scientists. 
They were not there at the beginning. They don't know everything, which is why they're scientists. They're trying to learn things. They don't always tell the truth. Sometimes they don't tell the truth on purpose. Have any of you ever seen that picture? Anybody? Ever, ever seen that picture? Yep. That picture was uh, developed by Ernst Haeckel, a German evolutionist in 1877. And he says, as the different creatures develop in the womb, they go through their evolutionary history, and at the same stage of development, they look basically the same. And you can see it from the evidence. He called this the embryonic recapitulation. The embryo is rehearsing the evolutionary history. Or ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Beautiful pictures. Only problem is, they were a fraud. I'll prove to you they were a fraud because in 1997, a team of embryologists in England decided to take photos of the embryos that Haeckel had in his book. So there are Haeckel's drawings for a fish, salamander, turtle, chicken, rabbit, human. There are the actual photographs of the actual embryos. And those are embryos of other creatures. But here's a high school biology text used in 1998 in America. And uh, up at the top are Haeckel's drawings. And if the kids don't get the message from the pictures, they get it from the caption. Early in development, all em vertebrate embryos are remarkably similar. They don't always tell the truth, sometimes on purpose, sometimes because they don't know everything. Frequently, they make mistakes. So they tell us we evolved from ape men. Uh, that's a lie, too. I'll just give you one evidence of the fact that they make mistakes in claiming this. One of the evidences they have presented for human evolution from apes is what were called vestigial organs. They said there are 100, at the beginning of the 20th century, 100 years ago, they said there were 100 parts of the human body that had no function, that were left over from our evolutionary ancestors, the apes, or even earlier. But today, medical research over the last 120 years, we know every one of those things has a function. So when they said 120 years ago they don't have any function, they weren't telling us anything about those parts of the body. What they were telling us about was their ignorance. They didn't know the function. They assumed there was no function. So they weren't there. They don't know everything. They don't always tell the truth. They frequently make mistakes. And most scientists are like most people. They're suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. Because of sin, they are denying the obvious truth in the creation. And Paul said, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They push it down. They try to get it out of sight. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. Their conscience tells them there's a God. God made it evident. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. So they are without excuse. I don't know who made my laptop, but I can study this laptop and know it was not the result of time and chance and the laws of nature. And I can learn some things about the creator of this laptop. I can learn that he likes symmetry, so he made everything uh, balanced. He likes beauty, so he made uh, things like a little apple to light up. He, made, he, he likes functionality, so all the keys work. So I'm learning things about that person even though I don't know who it is. You look at your hand. Your hand is a, a marvel of engineering. We've made artificial hands for people that have accidents, but they're nothing compared to the human hand. This is showing evidence of a creator. So the evolution tree of life, the creation force of life, if I had time, I could show you that there is no scientific evidence, real evidence, that stands up to careful scrutiny for evolution. And your teacher, Chris, can tell you uh, a lot about that. But what we see in the world, the real world, fits with what Genesis says. And Peter said, we need to sanctify Christ and Lord as, as Lord in our hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. You live in a generation that's very different from the one I was in when I was your age. When I was your age, most of my friends believed in God. 
Uh, people, people believed basically in Christian morality. There were some kids that were messed up, but most kids were pretty good kids. And they believed that there was right and wrong. You now live in a generation where most of your peers say there are no absolutes right and wrong. You can just make up your own rules. In fact, if you don't like what you are, you can redefine what you are. And you can call yourself a girl even though you are really a boy. Or you can call yourself whatever you want every day of the week. You can change what you are. That's not true. You can't say that you're the President of the United States and be the President. You can't say, well, I can actually fly, so I'm going to jump out of the Space Needle downtown Saint Seattle and fly over the, over the port. Well, you can think that if you want, but it's stupidity because reality is you can't fly and you can't change your gender. And your gender, as male or female, is a glorious gift from God. Embrace your gender. Celebrate it. And learn to be what God meant you to be as a boy or as a girl, as a man or a woman. Because in that, embracing that truth, you will find blessing in your life. Well, we've got